Let the church say amen. 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 God says, if you'd only trust me, your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, neither has it entered into your hearts the things that God has in store for them that love him. If you only trust me, he'll give it unto us. Amen. Stand to your feet for just a moment. Stand to your feet. Amen. We thank God for this time of worship and fellowship. It's good to be in the midst of the saints one more time. Amen. 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 It's good to be here. Good to be here on holy ground. God bless you. Let's, let us pray. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we give you thanks and praise. We honor you, Father God, for you alone are worthy. We realize it was by your divine touch that we woke up this morning, able to put on our clothes, eat food, and move around with the activity of our limbs. Lord, we thank you for that. I ask that you bless us now that we've come here to gather together to fellowship and worship you. Pray, Lord, that you continue to bless us, Lord. We thank you from the opening of the service until now. You've blessed in an awesome and mighty way. And I pray that you, you would use me, Lord, to speak to these, your people, Lord. Speak to me even with this word, Lord. I just give you thanks now. You are just so awesome, just so loving, and just so kind. Speak to us, Lord. I, I thank you now for those that are to be saved, those that are healed, those that are delivered and set free in this place, Lord. We count it done. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. If you don't mind, I, I want to read a passage of scripture coming from uh, the 15th chapter of Luke, and it's a very, very familiar. I just want to read, read the passage because um, going to be referring to it in the message this morning. In Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse, and it's the parable of the lost son. I'm going to be reading NIV, NIV, Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 11. I'm sorry, I had them start at 15. Um, no, 11, it's 15, 11. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, um, in, in, in the 15th, Oh, New King. I'm going to be reading New King James 2 then, just a minute. It says, uh, the parable of the lost son, uh, uh, familiar, familiar parable. In verse 11 it said, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided them to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he set, sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, I, I just want to lift up um, um, a, a thought from verses um, 15 through 17 here. Um, it, it says, 
I, I tell you what, I'm just going to read verse 17. The first line of verse 17 says, but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, uh, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I want to talk about humility in the hog pen. Is that all right? Humility in the hog pen. You may be seated. I wanted to read all that and go ahead and read the whole par uh, parable that Jesus presented so that we'd be familiar. I, I know oftentimes we, we stand here and we take a text and we, or we take a, a subject and, and we say, well, you know the scripture, you know that, and, and sometimes you may not know it. That's why I wanted to read the whole uh, uh, passage in context so you will know what happened, the son leaving and saying what he wanted and, and so forth. Uh, so that we all be on the same page. Because I'm not going to deal with the whole text. We're just going to hit on certain things. I want to talk about, the, like I said, humility in the hog pen. Now, this is Luke, the 15th chapter. And if you're familiar with uh, scripture, Luke 15th chapter is a chapter called the chapter of lost things, lost things. Jesus presents three parables here, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And, uh, he, and, and he's talking here, really, it says that the, the, the uh, publicans and the sinners and so forth had gathered around him, and there were Pharisees or religious folk that were standing off, and they, they saw who had gathered around him to hear him teach and, and to instruct them, and, and they rebuked him, saying, look how, you know, he hangs out with the, the wrong crowd and all this other stuff. And so Jesus puts forth... Uh, uh, these three parables. But here he's really talking to the religious folk that were standing around, the religious self-righteous folk who thought they were better than other people. He was talking to them, but he was also talking to those that really gathered around him to hear him, the people that weren't as highly, uh, highly elevated as the religious folk. Maybe some people that didn't meet the standards of being, you know, holy, you know, like we sometimes put it in, in religion. You got to be this, you got to be that before God to hear you. And there were some folk that were gathered around him. It says publicans, tax collectors. We know that there were prostitutes that came. There were people that had been ostracized and put a... Uh, 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 put at arm's distance by society. They came to hear him. And he was talking to these so-called unworthy sinners along with talking to the religious folk, but he was talking to those that thought they were all that in a bag of chips when it came to religion, but he was also talking to those that had been left out, those that had been ostracized, those that feel, felt they weren't worthy even to come into the house of the Lord, weren't worthy to lift up their head to God. Folk who had been through some things who may still be in the things they were trying to get out of, he was also speaking to them in order to encourage them. And, 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 and so this parable here is to illustrate, these three parables rather, are to illustrate God's concern for all humanity, especially the lost. It's to show that he values every soul, every individual, and to show these religious folk that all people matter to God. Are y'all with me today? And, 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 and show that even in heaven there's joy over a lost sinner that has been restored. And so I just want to look at this briefly for a moment, if, if you all will allow me. Is it all right? Give me, give me 15, 15 minutes. Amen. How, how long can I have? Take my time, amen. Give me 16 minutes then. And so, so <coughs> y'all pray for me today. Watching the fight last night, had a late night last night. Sister House dragged me, dragged me down to the basement and, and, and put the, and actually, no, she didn't. We, we went to a fight. We went to, we didn't have a fight. Somebody going to leave out here, ooh, they had a fight last night. We didn't have a fight. We, we watched the fight. Let me clean it up. Sister House would me like, but, but pray for me. She kept me up past my bedtime last night. But anyway, so, so we're looking at this parable. Like I said, not looking at the whole parable in depth. We've gone over it before. I want us to see something real key here. Because in this parable, if you take a look at all three parables and line them up, uh, the, the value of the lost item began to increase exponentially. 
Let, let, me, let, me, let me show you what I mean. In, in the first one, it was a shepherd that lost one sheep. One out of a hundred. One. One out of a hundred is one percent. One percent of the total value of his flock was lost. One percent. But he still went out and looked for it and brought the sheep back. One percent had value to him. In the second parable, it was a woman that had ten coins and she lost one. Ten percent of the total value had been lost. In the first one, one percent. Second one, ten percent. Uh, had been lost, but they went out and they found it, and it was of value to them. In this next one, uh, the third parable that we're, we want to delve into, it was not an object that was lost. It was not a thing, but it was a person, a son, a child that was lost. Uh, yeah, I said a child. I know the fella had reached the age of maturity, but he, and he may have been thought he was grown or been grown, but he was still somebody's child. No matter how old our children get, come on somebody, they're still our child. They're still on our heart. And, but it was a child, a son that was lost. And you can't come, you can't, and any parent will tell you, you cannot put a price tag on our children. We'll give everything and anything for our children as long as it's for their betterment. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So, so, so the, 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 the value increased, especially when it became a person, a soul. So Jesus intentionally escalates the value of these lost things. The sheep, 1%, coin, 10%, and the child technically was priceless. So regardless of who you are, what you may have done in life, what folks may say about you, or even the negative stuff you may think about yourself, you have to realize this one fact deep down in your spirit, that you are priceless to God. God didn't spare any price to save your soul. He gave everything and the best that he had, and he's still giving it, even today. And so you are priceless. Tell your neighbor you're priceless. Yeah, they need to hear that. You're, you're not just valuable. You are priceless. Your life matters. Your soul matters to God. And, and so I want to look at this younger son for a moment, if we, if we can. We've labeled him prodigal. He's the prodigal son. It really, he, he's the lost son, just like the lost coin, the lost sheep. He's the lost son, but we call him prodigal. Now, prodigal means one who, if somebody is prodigal, it means that they, they, they spend uh, or, or they give away things lavishly and without restraint. And, and oftentimes, foolishly, they give things away. They're foolish and wasteful in their spending. But, but uh, over, over time and, and through reading of the text, we have added many more, uh, what do you say, definitions or other thing, connotations to what prodigal means. When we hear about the prodigal son, what comes into our mind? It's not just his wasteful spending, but we think of him as being rebellious. We, yes, we do. We think of him as being selfish, only looking out for himself, being disobedient or disrespectful to his father. We think of him being wavered, wayward and, and having that riotous living like it says in King James. We, we think of him as uh, the prodigal son of having, as having low moral standards. And so we've added a lot to this word prodigal just by looking at his actions. We considered him the bad seed the bad son. Hello, somebody. And, and it, it, it just puts me in mind that we are quick to label folk. In church, and I, we, we're quick to label people. If they're not as spiritual as we are, you know, they, you know, they, they dead, you know, they, they're not all that, you know. But, but we label people too quick and too fast. We really don't know what's in their heart. And, and I know some of y'all are saying, thank God, because we don't know what's in your heart either. Yeah, only God knows, but, but, but sometimes we put a label on, on, on people and it doesn't fit them. I want us to see this prodigal son because technically I don't believe he's as bad as we think he is. And so for the next several moments I want to take a look at this son, but I want to take a look at him through a lens of reality. I'm talking about reality, real life, to see if we can understand his actions and his motives in what he did. Not just, uh, and I'm not doing that to justify what he did, but I want to see if we can maybe recognize somebody in the parable 
other than the prodigal son. Somebody else in place uh, of him that, that may be sitting in our seat, that, that seat next to you, I'll put it that way. Maybe sitting in the seat next to you, all right? Just, just work with me, all right? Y'all gonna work with me today. If you work with me, I'll be through in just a few, because if we work together, we get the job done a lot quicker, amen? If I hear a couple of amens, I, I, may, I, I may say, take the benediction right now. Let me quit lying. No, I... <laughs> Somebody yelling out, amen, hurry up, amen, hurry up, amen. <laughs> Woo, let me slow down. Y'all, I uh, see, I know church folk. Church folk will sing all day, shout all day, but when it comes time to giving or preaching, let's make it quick. Hello, somebody. Just, just give me a few minutes. I, I'm serious. Just give me a few minutes. But we look at this, this, these sons, and, and a certain man had two sons in verse 11. Then it says in verse 12, the younger son, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And it says, so he divided to them his livelihood. So, so here this son is. He, he wanted, listen to this, listen to this now. Let's talk about reality, all right? He wanted what he thought he had coming to him, and he wanted it now. He wanted it now. He was impatient. He didn't want to wait on daddy to pass away and get an inheritance the way you get an inheritance. Either you get it voluntarily by the person that's still alive or you get it once they're deceased. But you don't go up to them and tell them, give me what belongs to me when you're going to be dead. No, you, you, you don't do that. So, but, but, but he wanted what he thought. That's in his mind. I said, let's, let's look at it from his perspective. He wanted what he thought was his, and he wanted it now. He felt he was grown enough. He felt he deserved it. So he said, Dad, give me what belongs to me now. I can only imagine the conversation the father and the son had. Uh, he probably said, you know, Dad, I'm, I'm grown now. I don't know what the age, well, the age uh, in, the, in the Jewish custom of, uh, uh, culture of being a man was 13. I'm, I'm pretty sure he was older than that. He, he said, Dad, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm grown now, and I, 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 I worked on this estate for you. I helped build it. I, I, I supervised these servants over here, and we built that barn, and we did that. And, and, and so, Dad, I, I, I know I got something coming, and I, I want part of my my part of my inheritance that belongs to me, and I, and I want it now. I want what I think I ought to have, and I want it mm. Anybody in here ever felt like you deserve something, and you want it? Come on, somebody. And you want it now? Well, he felt he deserved it. He, was, he felt he was grown, and, and so he wanted it now. Let, let, let's, let's go back in our lives. When, when you turn 18, yeah, 18, that magical age, because when you turn 18, you automatically feel that now I'm, I'm grown and I, I can smell myself, so I must be grown. And Come on, that's what the old folks meant when they said, you, oh, you smell yourself, huh? In, anyway, and, and so you, you felt like you ought to be able to do what you wanted to do and because now you are grown. I'll even give you age 21. I, I'm speaking of living, still living at home with mom and daddy, and, 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 and you feel like you are grown. And, 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 and the father, uh, jumping back to the father in the text, the parable, he heard his son, and when he heard his son say, I want what belongs to me now, he wrote him out a check for a third of what he owned. The other two-thirds went to the older son, but he wrote out a check for a third of what he was worth and gave it to that younger son. Now, that's how it went in the text. That's why I know that this father that Jesus was referring to was not of African-American descent. I I'm just telling the truth. Because I believe the conversation would have gone in a completely different direction. Hello, somebody. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, let's tell the truth and stay in church. Uh, 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 to tell the truth, the conversation probably wouldn't have ever happened if it had been in a house of color, African-American household. But, but, but let's just say it did happen. And, and say you did have nerve enough to go to daddy and, 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 and bring this up in the first place. And, and, and because you're 18 years old or because you're 21 years old and still living in mom and daddy's house and, and you bring it up and tell daddy, uh, uh, daddy, I'm, I'm, I'm grown now. And, and because I'm grown, I want to come and go as I please. I want to be able to stay out, take the curfew off me. I don't want to have to come in when the street lights come on. I don't want to have to come in when the, when, when the clock strikes 10 or strikes 12. I, I, I'm grown now, and I ought to be able to stay out as late as I want to. Hello, somebody. Oh, if you didn't say it to mom and daddy, you know you thought it. But thank God he gave you common sense enough not to say it. That's why you're able to reach age 19. But, but you tell daddy, I'm, I'm grown now, and I, I want to stay out late, and I want to do what grown folks do, because I'm grown now. And I can, I can see daddy saying, huh, you, you grown now, huh? I know what I would have done. I haven't had one come and tell me they're grown yet. They, they're well over the age of 18. They haven't come and told me they're grown yet. But I, it, it, I can imagine what I would have done. I wouldn't have backhanded them like, like most parents would have. Boy, you're grown, huh? Pow! <laughs> I, I wouldn't have done that. But what I would have done was go to the bill section. I would have took out the house note, the gas, the water, the light, the car insurance. What else is it? Did I say house note, mortgage? Telephone? Tele I, I would have taken it all out. And I'd have been writing down numbers. He would say, Daddy, what you doing? Well, I'm adding this up right here. And I would have divided it in two. And I said, okay, you grown. Now, this is your portion per month. And this is what me and your mama going to pay. And he would have said, well, that's, I'm paying half of the bill. I said, well, you live in the whole house. You using gas and electricity just like the rest of us. So if you grown, you need to do what grown folks do and pay their bills. Yeah, I, I know I'm right about it. I know I'm right. I, young folk, I don't mean to be hard on you. I know you're grown. I know you're grown. Bless your heart. I know you're grown. And be glad. <laughs> Woo. Anyway, let me leave that alone. I'm not going to throw that in there. But, but I, and, and, and so <laughs> I, the, I know that his daddy was not one of us, because his daddy wrote out a big check for him. But I believe that if you live in a daddy and mama's house, you putting your feet on the daddy and mama's table to eat, you sleeping in the bed daddy and mama bought, you, you experiencing the air and AC that mama and daddy putting in the house, you know, if, if you really grown, either help pay the bills there or find somewhere else, prove to me you grown, and pay the bills somewhere. Because the next thing I say, no, I'm not paying the bills here. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going to, I'm going to pay somebody else's bills. That's what gets me. When, when the, as soon as you tell the children you got to do something here, you got to pay this. I tell you what, just pay this on, on the bill. Pay this on that. No, I'm going to go leave and get my own. You know what I say? Bye-bye. <laughs> I hope you find something nice in what mom and I hope you bye-bye. But but <laughs> and so so but but the point I'm trying to make is that it costs to be grown. There's some responsibilities that come with being grown. Now this son wanted to be grown and so he got what he thought what he ought to have and he took it and he left. The, the problem was that in taking what he had and going to a far off country, the son didn't know how to handle what he had. 
He didn't know how to handle it. He didn't know. He may have known how to handle the business back on the farm or on the where whatever kind of uh, 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 business his dad was doing, but he didn't know how to handle money. Obviously, daddy didn't have him in charge of money, and so he went out and and the scripture said that he wasted what he had on riotous living. He wasted. He didn't know how to manage his money. He didn't know how to choose friends. Uh, he'd go to the bar, go to the nightclub, and, and, so, and somebody would slide up next to him. He'd set up drinks for them, set up drinks for that one over there, set up drinks for that one over there. He was getting a lap. I mean, I mean, he was, um, <laughs> Lord, help me. But it said riotous living now. And he wasted his money. In other words, his money ran out. Money ran out. Let me get to the point I want to get to, though. His money, we, we know that all that happened to him. His money ran out. He found himself in a bad situation. He found himself, and a famine hit the land. And he found himself all by himself. No money, no friends, no anything. He was all by himself. He had no resources. And let me tell you something, young people, that oftentimes happens. As long as you have money, as long as you're able to pay the tab and buy a drink for this one and buy a drink for that one, as long as your car is running and everybody can jump in your car, as long as your apartment is open and everybody can come to your apartment, oh, you have friends all day long. But as soon as your car gets in the shop or, or, or gets repossessed, <clears throat> and you don't have a car, those fair weather friends will leave you high. No, they won't leave you high anymore because they don't have any money. Let me tell it, just tell the truth. They'll leave you high and dry with nothing because you, fair weather friends are only there when the weather's going good. As soon as a storm hits, they'll leave you all by yourself. But his money ran out, his friends ran out, a famine hit the land, and, and crops were hard, and it was hard on the crops, it was hard on everything, it was hard on everybody, and it says that he could not find a decent job. And the only job the young man could find was working in the hog pen. I want to stop there in the hog pen for a second, is that all right? I know we don't like getting in the hog pen because it's muddy in the hog pen. It's messy in the hog pen. You hear a lot of snout, snouting and growl, gr grunting and all this other stuff. And if you don't watch out, the hogs will bite you. And you it, it, it's rough in the hog pen. But I, if you don't mind, I just want to put a pin there and stop in the hog pen for a second. Is that all right? Understand a famine, you need to see this setup. The famine hit the land. Jobs were hard to come by. In fact, he couldn't even find a job. The only thing he could find was tending hogs that was technically against his religion, his nationality, to even deal with hogs. But yet he took a job feeding the swine. Can I tell you something about that? I have a lot of respect for this young man. He couldn't find the job he wanted. Couldn't find the job that, he, that kept him in the lifestyle he was accustomed to. But the brother needed a job. And the brother said, I'll do whatever I can as long as it's legal, even if it's feeding hogs. I like him. I like him. At least he got a job. You see, some of us are too good for some of these jobs. I, I, I look around and I, I, you know, I know unemployment for us is higher than for other segments of our society, but I look around and I see so many yards growing grass. I saw so many sidewalks and, and, and uh, driveways that needed shoveling. See, so many things that needed minor repairs in the neighborhood. If you can't find the job you want, there's still something that you can do to make honest money. Hello, somebody. You may have to swallow your pride. You, you may have to work a hard, rough, dirty job for a while. But, but I declare, if you're faithful at that hard, rough, 
dirty, low-down job, if you show your faithfulness at that job, I believe somehow God will open up a door and give you another job, a step up or two steps up. Or a lot. I, I do believe that because God honors faithfulness. It may not be the job you want. Yeah, you may have, you know, you may have got laid off at a good company, but you got a lawnmower in the backyard. Get your lawnmower, put some gas in it, and, and, and make sure it starts. Get you a little weed whacker. They don't have weed whackers anymore. They had those. They do have weed whackers? Somebody said, yeah, they do. I showed you last time I had a weed whacker. Get you a weed whacker. Get you, you know, two, three dollars worth of gas so you can cut about five, six, seven yards and make you some little money. And, 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 and then, you know, grab your buddy and tell him, come on, man, I, get, your, get two lawnmowers. We can cut twice as fast, cut twice as many. Start you a little. I, and, and the way you do it is you, you cut it at a cheap price and do it good. I had, some, I had some young fellas come to my house uh, last year, sister house. She's talking about I don't like cutting grass. And that summer I didn't. They came by the house, two young fellas going to college. And they, they said, uh, sir, can we cut your grass? I said, well, fellas, how much y'all going to charge me? They said $25. I said, yeah, here's $25 right now. Because everybody else is charging $40. And 50. I said, if you do a good, good job, I'll give you a tip. They cut the grass just like somebody professional. I said, I said, okay, fellas, y'all come back in two weeks and give me a number. They gave me the number and I put it in my phone. Two weeks came back by. They didn't show up. I said, I knew they was going to figure out that $25 was too cheap or for the going where, where, where we are. It, yeah, they charge a whole lot of money to cut grass. But, but, it was a, but I'm trying to tell you something. $25 is better than nothing. $25 for a half hour worth of work, that's good pay. Hello, somebody. What I'm saying is that if you really want to work, you can work and, and work, and, and God will bless you. God will raise you up from where you are. In fact, you know, your name ought to be on the side of a truck for a lawn business, for a snow removal bill. I'm speaking to somebody up in here today. Hello, somebody. Is, is there any somebody's in here? Any somebody's in your family? Oil up the lawnmower, gas up the lawnmower, push them on out to the curb. Tell them don't come back to your, hello, y'all. Y'all not going with me today. See, the sad thing is we, we have these nice parents today. We have these nice parents, you know, and I'm one of the nice parents. I have too big of a heart to, to you know, don't like fussing and fighting. So I, you know, and, and, and when you don't like fussing and fighting, you have to accept whatever you get because everybody else going to fuss and fight. But, I, I, you know, too, too, too easy, too easy on folk, too easy on, I would say kids, too easy on the kids because you don't want them to struggle like I had to struggle because I had to struggle when I was coming up. Oh, yeah, I, I struggled. I had a rough life. Woo! I repent. I'm sorry. Let me just tell the truth. But I did cut grass for two summers. For two summers. No, I, I cut grass for two summers in the hot sun, but it, and it was for a dollar eighty eighty-eight cents. A, no, it was, I got more than the other fellas got. I got two twenty-five. Uh -huh. And and but it was rough, but it was a job, and I did it all summer. And, and when it came time, y'all, uh, uh, 4th of July up here in Lockport, uh -huh. um, I didn't get to see 4th of July because I was working on 4th of July. I worked for the Park District, and, and I, I, I sacrificed a whole lot just to make sure that I learned integrity and, and how to do the job right. Even though everybody else was on the baseball field and doing whatever, I had it rough that summer. I had to work. It traumatized me. <laughs> Just like some folk today, work traumatizes them. It, they're afraid of work. But all I'm saying is that he worked. And so I, 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 I appreciated him. I like him because he had a good work ethic. But the scripture said in verse, 17, verse 16, it says that when he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods or with the slop, that the swine were eating, 
and, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself. Humility. I see humility. First he had humility for even doing a job that was technically beneath him. That was a beneath and, and really a slap in his face according to his heritage and, and his religion. It was beneath him. But yet he still did it in order to make some money. And it seemed like he didn't even make much money doing that. And, and it says, but he came to himself in verse 17 and said, I will arise and go. Look at this. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me want like one of your hired servants. I want to show you humility. This is absolute humility. Look where this boy started off at. This boy started off third in line over a nice, prospering business that his father had. His daddy was first, his older brother was second, and he was third in line. Uh, he was the second vice president of his father's business. But now here he is in the hog pen. And, and he comes to himself. And he begins to show humility, but not only did he show humility, he showed great character in what he did as far as his work ethic and as far as coming to himself and finally saying, let me go back to my father's house where I didn't have the want for anything, I can probably go back and be and, and, and take on my status as the second son again, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I know I did my daddy wrong. I'm going to humble myself and go back and say, Dad, just make me like one of your servants, and that'll be fine for me. I know I did you wrong. He humbled himself. Understand something, he was showing great character in what he did, even being in the hog pen and even coming to himself and saying, I'll just be one of your servants, daddy. He humbled himself and showed great character. Let me tell you something about character. Character doesn't show up all the time in public places. What we show in public is a lot of times our personality. Our personality or how we want people to perceive us. Character comes out when you're all by yourself or there's nobody around that you know. Hello, somebody. Come on, somebody. Because, see, we can do things in secret that really show who we are that we would never do in public because I want you to have a different perspective of me. Character is when you're all by yourself, nobody to gauge you, and you do whatever you do. Good character, you do the right thing. Poor character, and you'll do the wrong thing. Yeah, you'll see somebody drop a $20 bill. <laughs> and hope nobody saw you. But good character would say, hey, Somebody dropped the twenty dollar bill. You go to the store, you know, the counter or whatever, the service, uh, or you try and track the person down. Is this your twenty? You know, that's what good character will do. Hello, somebody. Good character will uh, uh, won't run your friends down when you're not around them. Oh, y'all miss that? Because the same friends you running down to the other friend, when the other friend when gets with them, guess who they running down? But good character won't let you talk about a friend. Good character will make you maintain your integrity at all times. Now, I know you're saying this, this was a low-down little uh, fella here. He took his daddy's money. He uh, told, uh, kind of told daddy, I wish you would die so I can get your money. He didn't say all that. But he took his money and, and wasted it. So we look at him as being low and 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 and. and riotous and all these other rebellious and all these other different things, but he had character and he said, I'll go to my father and humble myself and say, just make me as one of your servants. That took character. It takes a lot of character to humble yourself. That's why you don't find much character. Mm. I'm going to say it. I'm going to just say it. Y'all get mad at me if you want to. You don't find a whole lot of character even in church today. Because people are so prideful, don't want to take back on anything, don't want to 
beg pardon on anything, don't want to humble himself and, and, and on, on a whole lot of things. I'm just saying people now. And some of these, in the church, you know, especially with the one, and I know this is an old one, we always talk about how, you, you know, they walked past me and didn't say nothing to me. Did, did you see them walk past you? Yeah, they walked right past me and didn't say nothing to me. Well, what did you say to them? I didn't say nothing to them. <laughs> then why are your feelings hurt? You didn't say anything. Why you think they were, and, and so things like that. And, and so, in other words, that individual would have had to humble themselves to speak to the other person. And I'm not going to humble myself and speak to you first. Speak to me first. Oh, y'all never had that happen? Oh, you walked right by me, didn't say nothing. Well, if you saw me walk by, why didn't you say, hey, hey, how you doing? You know, and little petty things like that get me. That shows low character when somebody has to, let me move on. Let me, I, I, ooh, I, I may be sticking somebody in the side. I don't know, man. But, but you understand what I'm saying? So character is developed uh, when there's a lot of pressure put on the individual. Character, character. That's when our real self comes out. When the problems hit, and look at his problems, had nothing, eating with the swine, not even being able to eat with the swine. The owner of the swine wouldn't let him eat the food that was going to the swine. But look at his situation. All this pressure down on him, and what was he to do? All this stress. That's when character comes out, when you find yourself under pressure. When you look around and you don't have any help in the natural, that's when your character is going to come out. When you look around and friends have left you, your family is far away, you don't have any money, don't have any resources of your own, that's when your character is going to come out. His character began to show. It showed that his daddy had taught him well, even though it didn't kick in until he got into the hog pen. But he said, I'm going back to my daddy's house because I know my daddy took care of me real well. Never missed a meal at daddy's house. Always had a place to lay my head at daddy's house. Let me go back to daddy's house and just say, daddy, just make me a servant. So he went back, he humbled himself and, 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 and went back. And, and it says here in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, verse 19, and my, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And the scripture says, and he arose and came to his, to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. In other words, parents, our children may act up, and they may do things that we don't want, never taught them, never wanted them to do, and, and hate that they're doing it, but some, it seems to me that this father, it was not an accident that daddy was at the gate. Daddy saw the young man coming down the road. It was not an accident that daddy was out there looking for him. I believe every day daddy went out there, walking down the driveway, saying a prayer. Lord, wherever my boy is, take care of him. And Lord, if nobody's taking care of him, he's out, Lord, Lord, bring him back home. Let him know that I'll accept him back home. That, I believe that father was praying that every day as he walked down to the driveway. Got the mail out the mailbox. Man, that's me, that's me, that's, I don't know. Let me back up, let me back up. As he walked down the towpath and looked down the road, every day I believe he was praying for his son. Parents, what am I saying? Children are going to do what they want to do. When they get old enough, they're going to do what they want to do. And, and we can't, they come, of, come of, of an age where we can't tell them anything. Because in 18 years, 21 years, they've learned more than we've learned in 40, 50, 60 years. They're smarter than us. Just, just accept that. They're smarter than us. Or so they think. So they're going to do what they want to do. And you're not going to be able to tell them anything. Sometimes to a foolish child. And so that's the time they're going to be on our hearts anyway. Just go ahead and pray for them 
and release them to God. And say, God, you know where my child is. I don't know where they are, Lord, but you take care of them. And just release them to the Lord. you got to let go of them sometime. Yeah, you got to cut the apron string. You never cut the heart string, but you need to cut the apron string sometime. And just pray for them. And I declare, if you pray for them and believe that God is a prayer-answering God, God will answer your prayer and send your child back home in good shape. God will deliver your child from whatever they may have gotten caught up in. And this daddy went to the, went to the end of the walk, and it says, and he... he, he uh, um, Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He could see by his son coming down the, 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 the way, the walkway to the house, that his son had been through something. He could see it. But regardless of the stink that he still had on him from the hog pen, Regardless of all the mud and dirt he picked up in the life where he went out to try and, 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 and feel himself and, 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 and make it his own, regardless of all the stink, all the dirt, all the hurt that he'd gone through, this father realized this is still my child, still my son, and he welcomed him back. He had compassion on him fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's humility. That's humility. We have to learn how to humble ourselves. When we humble ourselves before God, God lifts us up. Greater than what this father did, but this father represents God here. And you know this son represents who the son represents? You know who this son represents? It represents those young men out on the corner. It represents those young ladies walking the streets. It represents that, and I'm getting the term right, wrong, but it represents those that are in the crack houses. It represents those that are shooting needles up in their veins. It represents those that are just doing all kind of wrong. But this son also represents us. Because we've been in the hog pen. I know we don't want to admit it. We're cleaned up today, thank God. But every now and then we stepped in that muddy hog pen too. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the compassion of God. And what this is showing that if we humble ourselves, I don't care how dirty you may have gotten. I don't care how far you may have fallen from, from what you've been taught in church or what your mom and daddy taught you at home. I don't care where you may find yourself, how deep and how stinky the mud may be, regardless of the company that you're with, whether they're pigs, swine, wolves, sheep, whatever it is, wherever you may find yourself, if you humble yourself and say, God, hear me. God, hear my, save me, deliver me. God will hear your cry, and God will deliver you. God delivered this young man and brought him back home to his daddy. And his daddy had a celebration because my son that was dead is now alive. Humility in the hog pen. Humility is the key. When we humble ourselves before God, he exalts us in due time. Anybody in here want to be exalted? Do you really want to be exalted? All you got to do is come clean with God. He can't exalt you holding on to a whole lot of stuff that we know we need to let go of. When you humble yourself, God will raise you up and restore you back to where you were. He restored his son. He restored his son. Somebody say restore. He restored him to full status as his son. The same thing that God does for us when we come humbly before him. I, I know, I know we can't see the mud. We can't smell the hogs. But there's still rest restoration for you. Yeah. Try God. I'm speaking to somebody here today. Try God. Try God. I, and and, and y'all get me wrong. I'm not talking to the one that's not saved. Hello, somebody. I'm talking to us as in here. 
Hello, somebody. The, one that, the, the, the ones of us that dress up real good on Sunday. God is waiting for you to come back. Restoration, humility in the hog pen. Amen.